All right, open up, please, to 2 Corinthians. We're continuing this. Uh, this is our substitute for Wednesday night. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. As I've been working through this book, I have to admit, it's a rather disjointed letter. And some scholars, and I disagree with them, but some scholars see it as two letters put together. Uh, I don't think that's it at all. I think what you see is Paul wrestling with a couple of two or three issues and and his emotions are in it. Now that doesn't mean that it's not inspired. It is inspired, but God uses the personality, the vocabulary, the background, and the emotions of, of, of the writers. And so you see that come out. And, and you see some pain in this. And I told you in the last lecture, read this book and see if it's either Paul's pain-filled letter or his joy-filled letter or both. And I, I think it's both. I, I tend to focus on the pain part of it. And, and I'll tell you why. Uh, being a preacher uh, and, and understanding a little bit of the struggles that Paul did... There's a statement in here, the more I love, the less I am loved. That, I, that just hurts uh, when, I, when I read that. Uh, I, I can relate a little bit to that. I've been very fortunate and blessed as a preacher, and most of my experiences have been positive, although I tend to focus on the ones that were hurtful. Uh, you, you see that going on, and we'll, we'll explore why Paul was being hurt by the, the church at Corinth. As we get on towards the end of the book, it'll pop up a little bit throughout it. But anyway, it's, it, it's very disjointed. The sentence structure in and of itself uh, makes it not easy to read at times. Uh, read and understand about is what I mean. But he says in verse 8 of chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Now I can't relate to that, but I certainly know what it's like to be filled with stress for a church. Um, but anyway, indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but to God who raises the dead. He's going to ask a question, uh, who is sufficient for these things? And then he's going to say that God makes us sufficient. Uh, we can't do it on our own. You, you see a little bit of that thought pattern here. One of the great blessings of life is when a person realizes that the only thing they can trust is God. My attitude and approach to ministry has always been uh, to better myself, which I think is a good attitude, but the problem is I relied too much on myself, and I know that a lot of us do. You know, we'll take another class, we read another book, we do everything we can to prepare ourselves to be up to the situation. But it's a great day when a person realizes, maybe a painful day that leads to this, but it's a great day or a great result when we realize that we can't trust on ourselves or trust in ourselves or trust on others, it is God ultimately that we need to trust in. And he says he delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. And, and God indeed does deliver Paul again and again. But there comes a time in which God doesn't deliver him in the sense of setting him free from prison and letting him continue to live because if tradition be true, and there's really little doubt uh, as to believe, uh, whether or not this is true, but Paul was beheaded by the Romans. Well, there's a sense in which he was delivered there and that he was delivered on to the, a better, better life. But he didn't... He wasn't able to continue on in this life. So Paul feels pretty good about the situation. He realizes that it's been difficult. He's gone through a lot. But God came through and delivered him. And he will deliver him again, he says. Uh, verse 11, you also must help by prayer 
so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So uh, we need to always see ourselves as working together and, and being a team. And one way that we are a team is that we, we help each other through praying for each other. I think we always need to remember that when we think about our missionaries overseas or stateside or wherever they are. Uh, we can help them financially, but we need to do more than, than just send them a support check. We need to be praying for them on a regular basis, and who knows how much good those prayers will do. Verse 12, for our boast is this, and this is really part of the disjointed, uh, difficult language here. But for our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behave in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely so towards you. So we, he says we behaved ourselves uh, and we lived as a, a good example to you. For we were not writing to you anything other than what you read and understand, and I hope you will fully understand, just as you did partially understand us, that on the day of our Lord, you will boast of us, and we will boast of you. So he he wants them to get this picture in their mind. Uh, They are a team. They are working together. And he is going to be proud of them on the day of judgment, and they're going to be proud of him. They, they helped each other get to, get to heaven, and that's something to celebrate. Because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace. Now, we don't really know exactly what he means there. I'm not even sure that the Corinthians would have known it. But anyway, he, he wants to come back to them and uh, impart some, maybe a spiritual gift, maybe some teaching, uh, maybe just fellowship. But whatever it is, he says, I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have, and have you send me on my way to Judea. He's still wanting to go, go to Jerusalem. Now, was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? In other words, does he make his plans... And when he speaks, is he wishy-washy? Does, can he be counted on? The reason I think that he's asking this question is, and this is jumping ahead, there are critics in Corinth that are trying to undermine his authority, and they're saying that he, he can't be depended on. Now, Paul wanted to be there. And he had planned on being there. But sometimes things change. And uh, that may have been the case here. But anyway, I've learned a long time ago, and some of you have heard me say this, I've heard a lot, I I learned a long time ago that if somebody, if, if you have a critic or somebody with a critical spirit and they ask you something and you say, maybe or I'll try to, that if they want to be Uh, condemning now you said maybe or I'll try to you didn't say most definitely but if you don't do whatever the the thing is they'll say you didn't keep your word that's not what happened that's that's not the truth of the matter but critics are not worried so much about truth as they are finding fault and I'm sure you've dealt with people like that in your life well, Paul says, I'm not a wishy-washy person. I'm not an undependable person. I'm not saying yes and no at the same time. As surely as God, verse 18, as surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. My message has been plain, clear. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him, it is always yes. Now, this is a powerful verse, and it, in its context, it doesn't seem to flow, but take this, lift this out of its context, and just think about it. In, in Jesus, all the promises are always yes. That is why, he says in verse 20, <clears throat> that is why... <clears throat> 
It is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. The simplest way, and I, and I learned this from a, a great preacher, the simplest way to understand this is you can always ask God the question, God, do you still love me? And the answer through Jesus Christ is yes, most definitely. It's not, yeah, no, I don't know. It's always yes. And that is a beautiful thought. You know, all of us struggle as Christians, or I think we do. And in our struggles and when we feel weak and when we feel like failures, we can always say, God, do you, do you still love me? Am I still your child? And the answer through Jesus and to that question is always yes. And that's what Paul preached. And that's the way he tried to live his life. He was trying to be clear and definite. But they were trying to undermine him and saying he was wishy-washy and couldn't be depended on. He didn't always keep his word. And that's nonsense. But critics usually operate in the realm of nonsense. Verse 21. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us. So he's, he's saying, look, we're, we're on the same team, we're in the same family. Uh, and we shouldn't be working against each other. And who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee or as a down payment. He, he's given us the Holy Spirit. He gave it to us when we became Christians. That's Acts 2.38. Uh, it's you, this, this statement is made over and over again that God has given us the Holy Spirit as a down payment or a guarantee that we are children uh, of his God. And he put his seal. That's an interesting little phrase. In ancient times, they, they had a, well, we have the same thing, sort of, uh, in the notary public. Uh, put that seal of the state on, on the paper, and it shows that it, it is... Uh, authorized that it is legal and it shows authority okay God has put his seal on us as owning us and he's done so and by giving us the Holy Spirit and you say well I don't feel the Holy Spirit in me I'm not so sure I've got it if you became a Christian you received the promise of God and the promise of God is if you repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you should receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have it. You don't have to, you don't have to feel it. You just believe it because that's what God says. <clears throat> but I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy and you stand firm in the faith. So why did, why did Paul not come to Corinth? As, as he had hoped to, uh, something's going on there that he, it was just better for him to wait a little while. He's still planning on coming, but he, it, but he needs to wait. He needs to let emotions settle down. And sometimes that's what we need to do. <clears throat> Obviously, we need to settle our disputes, as the Bible says, before the sun goes down, put aside a wrath. But there are times and situations where we need to wait just a little bit and catch your breath and uh, see how things work out. And we still make peace, but let things settle down, I guess is the best way I want to say it. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. you know, we don't know exactly what this first painful visit was over, uh, but he, he just didn't want to go through that again. <clears throat> or put them through it, for he says, if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain for those who, who should have made me rejoice. If I felt sure of all of you, that my joy would be the joy of you all, for I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart, and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Sometimes you got to you got to say painful things to people to let them know you love them and you care about them and you want them to go in the right direction. <clears throat> you know, we can go through life avoiding talking about difficult topics, but that's showing more self-love than it is love for others. 
You know, if you sit down with somebody and they're, they're doing some things that are, that are leading them in the wrong direction, you sit down with them. And, of course, you try to be kind in this situation, but you want to be plain. You can do that, and that is, you know, everybody says, well, I'm scared be, they'll get mad at me. Folks, that is not the issue. That's not the issue. The issue is helping a person. And so if they get mad at you, then that may be part of it, but you've still got to address those issues that are causing harm in another person's life. It, it is an act of cowardice to pretend that something isn't wrong. This builds, this builds better relationships than, than relationships based upon this, this uh, shallowness that never addresses real problems. So he says, now if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely to all of you. Now we don't know the exact situation of what is causing pain in this congregation. I, I, we can guess, and that's all it is, and it, it's probably a pretty good guess. He says, verse 6, for such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough so that you'd rather turn to forgive and comfort him. Okay, so whatever it is, whoever this person is, and uh, sometimes there's one person involved and sometimes they get other involved, but who, and this seems to be one individual. One individual has done something that has hurt the whole church, uh, that has hurt Paul. And now they have as a congregation, have punished him. Now, I think this goes back to 1 Corinthians 5. This is the guess. In which you have the man living with his stepmother in an inappropriate way. And that, that person, uh, they were, they were kind of saying, look how filled with grace we are, we're not condemning. And that's the wrong attitude when a person is living in outright sin. And Paul encourages them to turn him over to Satan. Go back and read 1 Corinthians 5. And this whole subject of withdrawing fellowship is a needed subject to study uh, because we too often times don't deal with a person that is causing great harm or bringing shame on the church. We don't deal with them. We hope the, 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 subject will, the, the person will quietly go away rather than us showing love, and that's what it's doing, showing love and addressing the issue and helping the person out. Now, Paul says, if, if they won't, won't listen to you, then you turn them over to Satan. You remember what Jesus says. Jesus says, you know, if you've got a problem with somebody or you know of a problem going on and you go and address them and they don't listen, you take two or three more, and if they don't listen, then you take it to the church, and if they won't listen to the church, then you treat them as an infidel or a tax collector. In other words, you withdraw fellowship from them. You let them know as a body that the church will not tolerate uh, divisive behavior, immoral behavior, or things like that. So I think that's what this may be referring to, but I'm not 100% sure. There could have been some things going on in the congregation that we don't know about, and and I think that may be the case as well. So anyway, he said, the, the punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. Okay, they, 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 whatever this person was doing, they got him set straight. If that's, you understand that's not meant to be mean-spirited, but they, they set the person straight. <clears throat> they, they let him know that they were not pleased with his conduct, his actions, his attitude, whatever it is. But n when you've done that, you've also got to forgive the person and let them know you love them again. You know, sometimes we get a person told uh, and the problem is, is after that, we don't say, now look, I did this for your good uh, and, and to help you, and, and I want you to know now I love you, and, and we're good now. Let's, let's, be, let's be friends, let's be brothers or sisters again, 
but sometimes we just get them told and, and then don't let them know the other part. And that's what seems to be going here on here. So he says, <clears throat> and I think this is important, what he's going to say in the next couple of verses. For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I've forgotten anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we're not ignorant of his designs. Okay, what in the world does all that mean? Paul says, look, I forgive the guy. If you forgive the guy, uh, if there's something I hadn't forgotten, I forgive him of that. But he says, we, we don't let Satan get in our midst and get a foothold. And how does Satan do that? Satan can ruin a church if the church is not a forgiving church. That's what Satan wants us to do, is to not be a forgiving people. Now, he wants to do a lot of other things, but that's, that's certainly part of it. All right. <clears throat> we'll finish uh, chapter 2, and, and that'll be it for today. And then we'll, we'll get into, he, he changes direction a little bit. But I want you to see some, something very important here. He said, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me and the Lord. Now, that's a great thing. He comes to this town. The door's open, there's great opportunity, uh, there's much work to be done, there, there are people that are receptive. This is, this is a missionary's dream come true. Man, this is great. I'm here, people are, are ready to hear God's word, ready to respond positively to God's word. But he said, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of him and went on to Macedonia. Here's, here's something that Paul would have prayed for on a regular basis. Lord, help me to find receptive people. And he comes to a town and he finds receptive people. But he leaves. And he leaves because he's there by himself. And, and that just bothered him. And so he went on to another place. Now what lesson can we learn from that? We can learn very quickly that we need each other. And, and we may be in a place where we're working and, and accomplishing great things, but if we feel alone, we, we may get discouraged and, and move away. When I think of this, uh, it, it has a practical application uh, for supporting missionaries. In the past, and, and it still happens, but in the past, <clears throat> when missionary work in Churches of Christ in America was still in its infancy, basically, somebody would decide to go to the dark continent of Africa, some country over there where there was no churches, and we would support them, and as we should have. And they would go over there with their family, but that was it. And a lot of our missionaries became discouraged, even though they were seeing the fruits of their labor, even though they were baptizing people, a lot of them just wore out and came back home and left the work unfinished. Why? They didn't need to be alone. And so now we see a lot of times we see missionaries going in, in teams uh, and that works out much better. It doesn't always work out perfectly, but it works out so much better. I remember talking to a friend of mine that was a missionary in Scotland. Now that's a beautiful country filled with wonderful, warm people. Now it's a hard work as far as, uh, as making progress with the church. You don't see that many conversions while the people of Scotland are spiritual people, that doesn't necessarily mean that they listen to what the Bible says. And this preacher was telling me that he and his wife and two children would get video or audio cassettes uh, from their family back home. And they would sit around the tape recorder and listen to those. And they, he said they would just sit there and just cry and cry because they were so homesick. Some of that could have been remedied had he not been there by himself, but been there with a co-worker and, and other people that believe like him, and they supported each other and worked through their problems together. 
Well, you see the importance of Paul. You know, he's always traveling around with co-workers. And here he finds a place where he's all alone. The work is wide open. But there's nobody there with him to help him, to support him. And so he, lo- he leaves. <clears throat> Verse 14, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in a triumphant procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. We're on a victory parade. And whenever the Romans would have a bat, win a battle, they would come back into town and they would, they would march through town and they would uh, burn incense uh, and, and it was a sign of victory. And he says that's what we're on. We're on a victory march. And as we're marching through this world, we are spreading the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. We're letting people know who God is, that we're his people, and that we're winners because of Jesus. But the message is not received by everybody in the same way. He says, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved. So to some people, we're a pleasant aroma. And among those who are perishing, uh, to, to a, one, a fragrance from death to death, to the, order of fra- uh, to the other, a fragrance from life to life. He says basically to the people that, that hate her message, that hate her lifestyle, we stink. We're repulsive to them. But we're still in the victory parade. They're just receiving what we are sharing in, in a negative way. And that's on them. Uh, N.B. Hardeman... Uh, used to be if you started out preaching, you, you were required to buy, it had to be in your library, the Tabernacle Sermons uh, given by N.B. Hardeman down in Nashville back in the 40s, I guess, 1940s, maybe 50s. Uh, excellent, excellent sermons. But the title of one of his sermon was the reception of any truth depends upon the attitude of the hearer. Now that's a long title for a sermon, but what a great truth. The reception of any truth depends upon the attitude of the hearer. You can present the truth in the best possible manner, but if the person has a bad attitude, they won't listen. And so that's why when you see people railing against Christians, you know, Christians aren't perfect by any stretch. But some people just rail against Christianity, rail against Christians. The problem is not with the Christians, it's with the person and their attitude that they can't receive the truth or won't receive the truth. This is the phrase I mentioned earlier. He says, when you think about this, we're on the victory parade, we're we're spreading this fragrance around, and some it's, it's a pleasant thing, to others it's a repulsive thing. But it's a big responsibility, and he says, who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. We are not sufficient in and of ourselves to do this task. We need the help of God. And that goes back to what I was speaking on earlier I've always tried to improve myself. I've always tried to take another class. I've always tried to find the answers to everything. And in the end, after chasing all kinds of Bible knowledge and all kinds of um, theoretical uh, wisdom, I've never felt sufficient in what I'm doing. And I'm not by myself, and neither are you. Our sufficiency uh, comes from God. And we need to remember that. We need to remember that. Because that's a very powerful thing. You know, Paul says that when he found out, this is later on in the book, uh, that when he was weak, then he was strong. Paul said that he went through these things. We already looked at this verse. That he went through these things to learn the lesson, not to depend on himself, but to trust God. And that is a great lesson for all of us. Our sufficiency is not in and of ourselves. Our sufficiency comes from God. And that uh, pertains to living our life. That pertains to sharing the gospel. That pertains going to heaven. We are not sufficient by ourselves. Our sufficiency comes from God. 
And that goes back to a phrase I think of in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, he has qualified us. We couldn't, we couldn't run the race fast enough. We couldn't do the work perfect enough. But we have help. He qualifies us. And so we'll begin next time in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. I hope that, that this cold weather will go away quickly. Uh, I hope that the Lord is blessing you, and I hope that you're trying to be a blessing to others. And that will conclude this lesson.